you are being considered for the amazing opportunity of life. If you are selected, you will have the chance to be born in a fruitful environment where you can grow, develop, and accomplish. Am I dead? I wouldn't say you're alive or dead. Are you the boss? I would say a cog in the wheel. <laughs> How long is this process? If you make it until the end. Nine days. Your senses will become unbearably sharper and stronger. <laughs> it's your new beginning. You'll never remember me or anything else that happened in this place. Ah. But you will still be you. Every single day, someone hurts someone else. Every single day, someone takes someone else's life. Why are you focusing on that? Why are you not focusing on that? You've been here a few days, but you've lived every second. Are you afraid? Of what? Nine days. Nine days. Hi, my name is Gil Robertson, president of the African American Film Critics Association. Today we have a real special guest for you as we are talking to actor Winston Duke, the star of the currently uh, in theaters, uh, uh, Sony Pictures classic movie, Nine Days. We're gonna start by introducing you to our facilitator, Katia Woods in Philadelphia, Emmanuel Noisette in Chicago, Jonesy in Virginia, KB in Houston, Janita in Indiana, Reginald Pounder, Reggie Pounder in Chicago, Ruben Rugald in Miami, Rhonda Rasha Penrice in Atlanta, and Carolyn Hines in Toronto. I'm gonna let you guys do what you do so well and I will see you on the other side. Hi, it's KB here with Through the Lens of Lady KB. Absolutely love, love, love this film. Will is such a complex character uh, mm -hmm. in a very important position of power uh, and judgment really, but meeting Emma really fundamentally, I feel like shifts him uh, in a way that softens him a bit. So talk a little bit about your development of Will. You know, did you draw from any personal experiences and any other characters that you may have already portrayed just to help weave in some additional layers when it came to Will? Well, with Will, and that's a great question. Um, what did I do to create the character? Um, with Will, it was, it was a lot of different things I did. So I one method of training that I used was Alexander Technique which is all about posture, spinal alignment, and breath work for essentially doing everything with as little effort as possible to create ease, because this is a character that was essentially doing everything that he could be to have a new state of existence. He did not want to feel like a human being. He did not want to emote. He was doing everything he could to keep it under control and be all about the action, all about what he has to do for his job and really focus on being diligent in the work. So for everything, I was just like, how can I be as fluid as possible? How could I just not exert as much energy as possible to be as effective as possible in any given circumstance. And he is very performative, which is, you know, that's, that's the whole thing about Will is he's trying to perform and be essentially what he believes every character needs without stressing himself. He is a walking stress test 
for everyone else. He's putting them in situations that is going to really yield results to see if they're going to be the ones that he chooses or not. And yeah, Alexander technique is one of the things I did. I worked on uh, smiling depression. I feel like it's a functional depressive state that will exist in where he can be productive. He can be present. He can do all, be in all these places in proximity to others, but be really torn up, dying inside, but just still just be present, which is something a lot of us deal with, we walk around with. So I worked on and researched a lot of um, smiling depression. And then I worked on his persona being his shadow. So in my experience, all of us have our light and our shadow. And our shadow are the aspects of ourselves that we tend to run away from, that we don't accept in ourselves. And they tend to come out under deep stress, um, whether it's a long-term relationship that lasts <laughs> no more than five years and a person actually finds and sees your shadow after you know a lot of circumstantial stress. Um, or it comes out under pressure of work, life things, different things, but your shadow tends to come out when you can't really control it. So I was working on this character existing inside his own shadow and not being very connected to his own personal light until it's ripped from him and it emerges at the end, which is why people respond so much to that big monologue at the end of the movie. That big performance at the end of the movie is one that exists in all of Will's own personal light. And everyone goes, wow, it's so magnetic because it's all of the things that were trapped inside of that character until the very end, until it's like sucked out of him. Um, and really just focusing on a lot of the relationships with the, the different characters. But that was a big part of my process, which was like blending, in this like crucible of my, you know, of my own person, um, all these different ways of being, all these different um, methods of, of, of figuring out who this guy is and like saying he died at a certain time where he's very in tune with classical um, performance. So he's redesigned himself as this like classical performer, even though that's not what he was in real life. So I worked on him kind of, feeling a little bit, if he spoke, he could have like a Paul Robeson kind of feel to him. And I worked on a mid-Atlantic dialect that wasn't, you know, it, it's very clear, it, it delivers information, but it's hard to just place. And my Trinidadian kind of sing song, it, it always creeps out. So we did a lot of work to make sure that didn't come through and that it felt like a very distinct character. One of the best compliments I've been given was a very close friend of mine was like, I didn't know who you were in that movie. I've never seen this person. I haven't, I don't know, that wasn't you. And there are times where I see more of you in your characters and I, I don't know who I saw in that movie. And I said, yeah, good, thank you. You know what I mean? And that, that's, that was, that's what we strive for. Well, brilliant performance, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for the question. How was the mixture of like the feeling of being a producer and also being a, in a, in a lead role? Mm, good question. So this has been my first official lead and it felt really great. A thing that I strive to do is I strive to make all my roles feel like leads because I always try to picture that my characters are the leads in their life. So I always position my character's belief system and their actions to be as if they are leading their own very full, complete story. And that story just happens to interact and connect with whatever is happening with whoever they're interacting with. So I always try to make my characters feel as whole as possible. So in a way, it was my first time leading a film but I play all my characters to feel as if they're actually the leads in the film. <laughs> and it makes me feel a lot more whole, one. Two, where it did differ was I was on set every single day. I was in every single scene in this movie. 
And that was just exceptionally taxing on the body. But whereas I would get up every morning, I would say, I don't even understand how we're going to get this done today because it's so much work. We had 117 pages to shoot in about 23 days. And roughly on most average films, you get through maybe three to four pages a day. We got through nine to 10, sometimes 12 pages a day of dialogue because it's very dialogue heavy and sometimes doesn't feel that way while you're watching it. And that took a lot of work. So every day I'd wake up and I'd say, oh my God, I don't know how we're gonna get through this. And then somehow we would get through it and make our day sometimes with time to spare. And it was just one of those things that I didn't know that I could do until I did it. And I had reshoots to do for like Spencer Confidential at the time. So I was like flying between Utah and Boston and going between characters and trying to like make this all work. And I said, I didn't know I could really pull this off. And then I left and I said, I'm a lot stronger than I thought. So it actually made me feel really good, made me feel bigger and more like able in my person after. So that's one major thing that came. And then the producerial aspect allowed me to get a little bit more distance from taking things as personal in the moving forward, because I realized there's so many different things that goes into hiring a person, casting, where they shoot, why, how long they stay, et cetera, et cetera, that as an actor, I just thought it was about me. <laughs> like, oh yeah, I didn't get the job because they don't like me. I didn't get this job because da 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 da. I remind this person of their brother and they hate their brother. So like, I, it, it allowed me to get some distance from centering myself in the work process and the work experience. And that was really valuable. So now when I get something or I don't, I know there's a lot of different decisions. Sometimes they just don't like you, but that might not be the only reason. So it just allowed me to just get some distance from, you know, being as, as centered in that thing. And it's, it's been exceptionally helpful. And then having ownership over the project, like I have more ownership around this project than anything else I've done so far to date. And that just creates a different kind of energy for when going to work on something that you help put together. It's, it's, it's your baby, it's your child, it's your creation, it's, 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 it's entrepreneurial, you know? It's like going and working for yourself and knowing that the hours that you put in are all for your own personal betterment as well. And it's not just servicing someone else. And there's something that's really powerful about that. It's something that's very adult about that for me. It was very, like, it, it, it made me feel like there was a lot of growth in me. Um, so that was really helpful. Thank you. Great movie, brother. Of course. Thank you so much, brother. Hi, Winston. I'm Reggie Ponder, the real critic out of Chicago. And the first thing I want to say to you is, it is about you, man. <laughs> it's, it's, it's all about you. Uh, thanks, Reggie. Uh, so, so when looking at this movie, when you guys were uh, making those last moments was beautiful and scary at the same time for me, mm -hmm. because it made you think of peace in one sense, the P-E-A-C-E, -E, but it also made me think of the possibility of not saying my piece or not completing my piece that I was brought here for. Does that mm -hmm. resonate with you at all? Oh, of course, of course. You know, I feel it's. So a thing that really helped me and a thing that I learned from this is that this idea of mutual exclusivity is it's a bit of a, of a facade. So it's, yes, I'm here for a purpose, but I'm also here to just be present. You know, I'm here for the big macro. I'm here with a purpose and I'm going to accomplish what I was placed on this planet to do. But I'm also here for all the micro, which is the walks on the beach, for the hand holding, for the kissing, for the eating, for the crying, for the sleeping, for the dreams that come while I rest, for the dreams that come while I'm awake and inspired. 
I'm here for all the small, you know what I mean? And it's about balance. So yes, I think about why I'm here, but I'm also, I've been left with this real gratitude for all the small moments. And then coming out of quarantine last year, where the macro wasn't as much in as much in as much jeopardy or threatened as much for all of us some of us it was some of us it was definite life or death you know um we lost people we lost family members so our macro was threatened but not all of us had the threat of the macro in the same way but the micro was put in complete jeopardy couldn't walk on the beach couldn't go to that sporting event and have that hot dog couldn't hold that hand couldn't go for that bike ride, couldn't share that family, that big family dinner that some of us have, that Sunday dinner where people come over and just shoot the shit. <laughs> and that was put in complete jeopardy and it made you question, are we ever gonna be able to get back to that? Is this thing gonna work? Is it ever gonna go away? Are we just gonna have to like deal with losing a whole bunch of people every single year? The micro was put in deep, direct jeopardy, which made us realize, it made me realize for one, how important it is. So the micro just as important as the macro. And wow. yeah, so for me, yeah, I'm here with this specific journey, but I'm also here to just experience and do my time and learn and have impact and leave. So. It's an acceptance of both. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's light and dark. It's whole and, and, and some. It's, 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 it's partiality and wholeness all at once. So that's what this movie left me with and the importance of like giving reverence and having reverence for all of it. Wow, uh, you, you just said what I wanted to say. Thank you so much. <laughs> I appreciate oh, of that. course, my guy, of course. What's going on, brother Winston? This is Emmanuel Noisette or uh, E-Man from E-Man's Movie Reviews out here in Chicago. Uh, look, I loved your performance and it was <laughs> such a driving force in the film. So congrats on that. Um, now, in the movie, we saw the impact of Emma's character chip away at Will, you know, throughout the course of the film. By the end, we get a real emotional scene between the two. Can you elaborate on the potential maturation of Will? Like, what do you think we'll see about on uh, from Will on the tenth day? That's a question for the ages. That's a question I asked. <laughs> I asked to the director. You know, I said after this moment of extreme growth and cathartic release, do you think he even exists anymore? Does he just disappear himself because he's essentially placed there and he learned whatever lesson he was supposed to learn? Um, because that's one of the things that Will kept saying, like, why am I here? Where he's like, everything just feels the same. I can't remember emotions. I can't remember anything. It all just hurts. And it all just feels like a dagger cutting away inside me. And it all feels the same. And I don't know why I'm here. And I think after learning why he's here, which is all is one and one is all. The small is as big as the whole. The, the partial is as great as the whole. The small is as great as the big. And after learning that lesson that he couldn't learn in life because he wasn't to some degree, as you're saying, mature enough. He wasn't mature enough to accept the love that was there because someone had to love him. And he still couldn't even accept the love that Keo was willing to give him. He just wasn't available for that. So after now learning that all these things are important, what does happen to him? I, I imagine that he disappears. I imagine that he graduates. I imagine that he's placed there because not everyone is placed there as an interviewer. The really important aspect about Will and the interviewers in this particular construct of, of an afterlife is that the interviewers lived. They know what life is. They know the full gamut of, of how painful existence can be. And, you know, in my own prep for this role, I 
research some of the darker parts of the world that isn't covered in the film you know it's this idea because will loses a lot of power after he makes the choice like he can't choose where they go they don't remember him he can't have any Im impact on the life that they lead once they are born and it's this idea that yeah that you go into a fruitful environment where you can grow but what about when you're born in a part of the world that's war torn what about if you're born in a part of the world with a family that is already stressed with a lack of resources and an area that doesn't you know allow for healthy growth i'm sure will has made some chosen some really beautiful people and he said it i choose flowers and other people choose pigs to eat them i'm sure he's picked people who just didn't last very long and he watched that so there's a lot of pain that he's also like there's a lot of pain that is off screen there's a lot of struggle that's off screen and i think him learning acceptance which is what he has learned by the end of the movie I think it's it's liberating. So I wonder what freedom really looks like in that world with that rule and with those rules. Um, and that's that's kind of that's my question as well. And it's that it's that it's this kind of movie that leaves you with more questions than answers. And we don't really have the answers. But I think that's where why it's so respectful of your intellect because it, it's not didactic. It's not telling you how to think, what to think, and when to think it. It's saying what is the, the Let's let's ask the questions together and I'm going to leave it with you to come up with the answers because your answer is just as valid as any of ours, you know. Thank you so much. I was just curious if he was going to go from VHS to DVD, but that's a better <laughs> answer. Thank you. Maybe, 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 <laughs> maybe things just update. <laughs> Hi, Winston. Kathy and Woods Couple Soul Show. How are um, you? Hi, how are you? Good, uh, good. couple of things my question is we know why he chose Cain, right mm. but if you as Winston who would you have chosen because even though Emma was all good you know very optimistic who would you have leaned against between you know going through the interviews feeling everything else who do you think would have made a better uh, conduit, for lack of a better world, to navigate uh, the world as we live in it. Who would have made a better conduit to navigate the world as, as we know it? I have a lot of empathy for Will, because where we meet Will is not a typical nine days. It's a typical nine, day where, nine days where he is grief-stricken. And I think the usual boundary that he, that he has with the people that he's placed has been blurred because he allowed himself to get attached to one person in particular. So whereas a regular nine days, because, because there are so many other people in the TVs, we can surmise, right? It's one of those things where we trust your intellect that you can, you understand this, is that you can sur surmise that he's gone through many other nine days nine days interviews before he's done this many times it's happened he understands how it works he's done this a bunch of times he's been here for a long time what makes this a different nine days and a very special nine days where he can't be the same is because of amanda and i believe where we meet him is he's just he's he's a raw nerve and he's trying to build the walls back up, but he can't build them up as, as fast as this girl can exploit the hole. <laughs> and she just keeps digging and she just keeps digging. And, you know, she's beautiful in the sense of she is innocent and she's pure and she's real and she's direct, right? It's not a beauty that is, that is, uh, that is driven by like sexual, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Sexual orbit. <laughs> you know, it's about, this character is beautiful because she is 
aspirational in how pure she is. And that purity and honesty is a big threat to him because he can't be that for himself. That's an aspect of himself that he also denies. And I have a lot of empathy for him because I think in his position, we all would choose Cain. And I think that's why he's so similar to all of us. Because I know most of us after going through deep trauma, you're like, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> oh, you did that to me? Nobody's getting another chance. You know what I mean? You lie, I'm looking out for every liar. If you stutter, you might be lying. You know what I mean? Like we've all been there where we've said, if that happened to me before, I need to make a big shift. And in that way, he's so much like us that I think I would probably make the same choice if given the same similar circumstance where I'm hurt, I'm in pain, I'm grieving, and I don't want to make the same mistake twice. And I've, I view my choices as a mistake. I think I would choose Cain. In other situations, if you're just asking me, Winston, what would you think is the ideal type of person to survive our world? I think a patient person is the ideal person to survive our world. A person who has patience and understands that things take time, has patience with themselves, has patience with the world because the world changes slowly. As much as it changes really quickly, it really changes slowly. Internal change happens exceptionally slow. External change happens very quickly. And I think a person that has real patience, patience by definition, which is, a, was, which is awareness. I don't think you can be really patient if you're not aware. If your mind isn't open, if your heart isn't open, if you're not educated to circumstance, that's not patience. That's just waiting. <laughs> patience, I believe, has a lot of agency in it. It's a choice. And I think a patient person would survive really well in our world. A patient person that understand that war is going to come, war is going to go. Bad things are going to happen. Good things are going to happen. Love is going to happen. People change. People may leave, people may stay. Patience and acceptance of whatever comes and a willingness to be flexible. And I think that's who I would choose. If I saw that a person was flexible, patient, and accepting, they're getting the pass. Got it. Thank you so much. My name is Brandon from LRM Online. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. So this is a beautiful movie. Um, and as you said, it, it leaves you with more questions than answers. And the question that I wanted to ask you was, was there anything about this movie that challenged either your uh, spiritual beliefs or beliefs about this world? Is there anything that you walked away struggling with or challenged with uh, based on this film? No, it wasn't challenged. I think my spiritual beliefs are pretty, pretty concrete. And I grew up Christian. But I'm the type of Christian that's just very open to everyone else's walks of faith and their own spiritual traditions and practices. I believe religion, spirituality, all that stuff is really leading in the same direction. It's the same thing as languages. You know, you might all be speaking different languages, but human intention tends to be very universal. Emotions, love is universal. Pain is universal. Anger, betrayal, all those things are universal. So in that same way, we're all kind of expressing and feeling a lot of the same stuff. We're just using different languages. So I'm super accepting of different um, spiritual beliefs overall. Um, and I can't say that it was challenged. If anything, it was more galvanized and concretized. Um, we had like things happen that was just like spiritual synchronicity on set where you know, set designer is making my notes as Will, made these notes about the characters that Will takes, like he wrote these things, but it was really the set designer that wrote those notes for me, maybe two months prior. And Zazie Beats and David Rizdal, David Rizdal plays the artist who like is really good at drawing, but hates his work. They're a real couple in real life. 
So that's Zazie Beetz's um, fiance. And her and I are in the scene in the office. And she looks down at my notes and she's like, I've always wondered what the, the characters are writing about each other. Like, what, 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 is, what your character is writing about us? Like, can I see? And I said, yeah, take a look. And then she looks at um, what I wrote about David's character. And on the paper, it said something about like a very Machiavellian approach. He has this, this, da, 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 da. And she goes, did David help you write this? Did David help you write this at all? And I said, no. This was set design. They probably did this a couple months ago. She goes, that's weird. He really didn't have anything to do with this? I said, no. And she goes, well, he's reading Machiavelli, The Prince, right now. That's really weird, right? And then in the, the cupboard behind me in set design, there was a book of poetry. That was a book of poetry about World War I veterans wrote all these poems and it was dedicated to this like colonel or something that survived three days um alone fighting the enemy and it was written that he didn't allow any enemy to pass other than into oblivion and i looked this guy up he looks like will he's just a white man but he's like tall like will they called him the Count because he was very quiet and silent and like a bit looming. He had the same glasses as my character, Will. And he was so shell-shocked after World War I that he went sailing and just never came back one day and committed suicide. Uh, or suicided, I think is the term that people use. And suicided. And yeah, I said, this is uncanny because this is the character. That is Will. And it's a guy who felt a lot like he was written that he was a very like soft, wonderful guy put into an extraordinary circumstance and survived. And what they wrote about him poetically was the action of what I'm doing as well. And I said, Edson, isn't this crazy? And Edson is an atheist. So in his opinion, he did not write a spiritual movie. The movie is inspired by the story by his his uncle his uncle committed suicide at, at 50 years old and the family wouldn't talk about this uncle they would just say don't be like your uncle he was weak your uncle was weak so as he got older and went through his own depression and his own like mental health stuff he researched his uncle found out this guy was a really beautiful guy that just never got to live the life of an artist that he wanted that he was a translator. Edson is Japanese, but a Japanese immigrant to Brazil. And essentially, this was an opportunity to rewrite the narrative of his uncle's life in an afterlife situation, give him another chance. And yeah, <laughs> that's this movie. And this movie in itself has a lot of spiritualism, but it was not the intention according to Edson, but it's just there. But I think that's what makes it really great art is because he made it for a very specific intention, but really great art attaches itself fibrously to our own experiences. And we can find depth and add depth to like something that already has a lot of depth when it comes and connects with your own experience. I think that's what's really beautiful about it, that it becomes a spiritual movie. It becomes a, a, a treatise on like, a spiritual journey and, and exploration because it has such specific intention and it connects to that deeper part of you that only has questions. You don't know if God exists. You don't know, but you believe you have faith. It's more questions than answers. It's more questions than answers. And I think those are the aspects of us where this movie really resonates. It resonates to the deep parts of us where we have more questions than answers, you know? Hi, I am um, Jonita Davis from the Black Cape, and I'm sitting here. You're answering. Your answers are beautiful, and they're answering every question I have. So <laughs> I'm making my, it out. <laughs> so I, I just have a simple question for you. What was your favorite scene or your favorite part of the movie? Oh my God, I love the gifts. I'm a gift giver. I'm a gift giver, and you know, my work. I tend to look at them as gifts anyway. Um, all my work from Black Panther, Spencer, 
us now nine days they're all gifts and they're all gifts that i hope outlive me and i loved how specific the gifts and how much time that it was written that he puts in to these gifts that he builds from scratch he builds a beach he builds a beach he you know he he makes sand and and water and and projection and like you know creates waves and it's a beach he finds tapes of sound and like creates the experience the bike ride with the with the blossoms was just i mean i still i still you know i tear up um i i still my emotional person is still so attached to the film that i still get really triggered listening to the um violin solos and things um and dealing with so much loss from last year um yeah like the whole movie still has a lot of meaning you know so all those gifts um all those gifts all those gifts are really important all those gifts are really important all those yeah <clears throat> Yeah, I love all the all those gift scenes. I love all those, like, take this with you scenes. The the bicycle scene always always is is a really meaningful one, and as a piece of art that you put out there as a gift itself, it's it's the whole movie is that the whole movie is this scene. You know, I I bet if someone's watching us all through these screens that you know. That might be what they write down on the paper if they're not going to make it through the nine days. They might like, be like, you know, make me a movie. <laughs> you know, they might ask their own personal will to make them a movie. And that might be the gift. And I feel, yeah, that's my favorite thing. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. And the gifts were amazing. I still have questions about those, but thank yeah, you. Please, yeah. Ask anything. Hi, Carolyn for Carolyn Talks. Um, this movie, I've seen this movie twice and it may ball my eyes up both times. And I think this movie, as you said, it's a gift and I think it really is. And I wanted to ask you about the two specific characters of Emma and Kyo, played by Zazie Beats and hmm. Bennett Day Wong. I see them as gifts to Will as well because they challenge him in very specific ways. Um, Emma, she challenges him to see himself in a better light. She challenges him to see himself outside of his own preperceptions and the mistakes that he believes he's made. And for Kyo, I see him as challenging Will to see other people outside of his own preconceptions and his own beliefs. And could you just tell me about working with these two amazing performers in the specific scenes? Because there's the final monologue, or as Edson um, called it, a dialogue mm. between um, Will and Emma. But then there's the scene where they're preparing the set for the beach. And, and Kyo is telling him, you need to stop thinking in very specific ways. You need to expand your horizons. And he's telling him about these parallel universes. And I see that as Will telling, as him telling Will, see these people as parallel universes and the potential they have. So could you just tell me about those scenes and working with these two performers for those scenes? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Big question. Um, first off, working with them is exceptional. Benedict Wong, uh, you know, I had the pleasure of, of meeting him through Marvel and I've always admired his work and I admired his work from, um, I admired his work from uh, Marco Polo when he played Kublai Khan. So when I heard, like, it's, it's actually Edson and I talked about him before Edson brought him in. He was like, I'm thinking about Benedict Wong as Kyo. And I was like, that's a great idea. We need that guy. Like, I've met him. He's an exceptional actor. Like, let's get that guy. You know what I mean? And then Zazie, like when I met Zazie, like Zazie is a super playful and open and just like, if you throw her a big ball, she'll catch it and she'll throw it right back at you. And that's great acting. Great acting is, is, is balance, right? It's feeling safe enough to experiment and have someone return the energy. And that's what that was. And at every given moment, it was a give and take. 
like I would do things and she would just be like hurt. <laughs> and then when it's her turn to like drive a scene, I'm sitting there like there's that one scene. Um, and I, 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 I had a lot more moments of like emotional expression that didn't make it into the movie because it was a very direct and clear choice for Edson that we save all deep emotional expression for the end of the movie. He was like, this is great. This is it. But like, it just, it's earned, but I need for people to just not have it until the end. And, and it was like, I, I need for it to not come out until the end like it's a pressure cooker it's a pressure cooker and i don't want to like open that valve until the end at all not even a little you know what i mean we've all made oxtails you know what i mean <laughs> like you know you don't you know that he's like i don't want that to come out until the end and that was tough i still gave it i still gave it to him i still gave him those moments where like in the film where a bit of emotion and would 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 give you guys a little bit of a respite to be like, ah. but he was like, no, I want to hold it. And it paid off, you know, and Zazie would hit me with some moments that was just like that. There's a moment where she's just reading me. And she's like, I think there's a person who is da 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 da. da, da. I was like, you need to stop ringing me. <laughs> I mean, so she plays really well. Benedict plays really well. And, you know, he and I would just rehearse a lot of our scenes right before we do it. We'd be outside, like going out and doing like acting exercises like we were in grad school, you know, because he comes from a theater background. And we were just like doing acting exercises outside, making sure that we have our chemistry was like potent. So once he got on camera, it worked. So we really worked like a theater company. And that was like my favorite aspect of 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 doing this work is that like i pushed for that edson was very accepting and all of us really just like rallied around this project saying like we're willing to do whatever it takes we did a, an ex, uh, extensive extensive um rehearsal process before this movie which is not normal for every movie maybe rehearsals like one day two days we would rehearse for like a week and a half and i showed up maybe three weeks before shoot uh we were shooting just to like stay in a cabin there in in um in in utah and just work and be in conversation with edson and come in and see the set that it was building and like familiarize myself with the rooms build a relationship with the sets all these kind of things um and yeah so working with everyone was just it was it was it, it felt like theater um and even though the crew isn't on on camera you could feel the crew in this movie because the sets are so hyper realistic that that could not have been done without really great set design like that room with all the the cabinets and the filing things um could not have been done without like the rest of the cast. And I call the crew of this movie, the rest of the cast, you know what I mean? Um, that's one thing, working with them was incredible. Um, what's the second half of your question? It was, what did I learn? Um, yeah, what did you learn from the challenges that these two characters and these performers gave you? Because it seemed like a lot of it is a learning process for you personally as well while you were making the film. Right, 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 right. What did I learn? I mean, I, I just learned a lot of just being flexible and trusting that everyone else is going to come and give you what they can and that they're going to be prepared. We didn't have any days on set where people like messed up lines. And we had, what, 117 pages to get through in 23 days. No one came in, messed up lines, and that is normal. There's no judgment in anyone like not getting a line right. But it was a testament to how prepared everyone walked in, you know, to do the work. Sometimes we would get our shots done in four takes because each take was just gold. <laughs> so that angle, oh, cool, we're on, we're on Maria, Ariana Ortiz. 
And she's like, <laughs> first take, <laughs> second take, <laughs> different things play, third take, <laughs> fourth take. Moving on, checking the gate, next, out, next angle. So everyone showed up ready. You know, Tony Hill, every time he spoke, funny. Wasn't like, let us let me improv and figure this out. It was like all his things landed, really funny. Everyone showed up really, really prepared. And it was just a testament and to how excited and how much ownership I think we all felt like we had on this project. And that's, a, you know, that, that comes with making a movie in that independent film model where you have more ownership. You know what I mean? Like you're making it by hook or by crook. It's not a big budget but it feels like a big budget because the quality of the work is so high. So, yeah. Hi, it's Rhonda. Listening to you, I am um, curious as to how you will move in the future. Like listening to how you speak, how has playing Will and being a part of mm. this process, how do you think it will change or impact how you move going forward in this industry? That's a great question. It's, it's really not just about how it impacts me on how I will move in the industry. It's about how I will move, period. <laughs> this movie has such lasting effects overall, actually. Um, and I haven't fully come to terms with what those lasting effects are completely up to this day. Like I had to do such intense work to get into that character, be in that mind space and live in that space that it took me a while to shed that character. It took me a lot of quarantine and therapy to like get out of the mental space that I took that character home and it was very heavy. And it really showed me that there aren't a lot of resources for actors and artists when it comes to like getting out of spaces that we lord them for being able to access those spaces to give us the work that they give but on the other side there's not a lot of like resources that are made available or people really going oh man what they're doing must be really hard it must be really hard to be in that place to write that album but damn adele could sing but you're not wondering what it's going to take for her to get out of that place to heal Right? Oh man, Joker was so amazing. But you're not wondering, oh man, what? Like no one has those conversations. I talked about that movie, you know, at length. No one was like, I wonder how he's like coming out of that and healing from that process of putting himself and his brain and his internal life in that space to heal, to come out of that role. So like, we don't really consider the, the strain that it takes on artists to like come out of and like heal themselves and work through some of this stuff. It's just like product, product, product. And we have a very capitalistic kind of view to art. So I've learned self-care moving forward. I've learned to really, really, really redefine self-care as not just the facial, but like the psychological, psychiatric work that, it, that I have to do, that I have to implement in my own process to come out of these things and come out healthy and come out whole for the people that are in my life, right? My family has to like be at home with me. You guys come and you spend two hours with me in the movie theater and you go back home to your life. There are people who are around me that has to spend their life with me. My team has to spend their life with me. My, you know what I mean? My loved ones. And it, you know, it reminds me of Chadwick, you know? It's like, we mourn Chadwick and 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 um, we mourn Chadwick and 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 viewers mourn like this person that they see on TV, but at some point you can turn off, but his family members, his friends can't. You know they're still mourning. Up to what a year? A year has passed almost, and they're still mourning because they're missing someone who spent 42 years with them, 41, 42 years with them. And we've spent moments with this person and it, it hurts. And it's like, oh man, I'm gonna miss that person on screen. But like, they're gonna miss that person from their lives. 
So I've learned that I have to really implement personal care, self-care, mental health in my own personal journey to move through this. I have to say no to too many of projects that are this demanding. Um, and anything that I take on that is this demanding in, in various ways, I have to really take care of myself coming out of it. So it's more of a, a, I learned a lot of personal things coming through this. And then when it comes to like the larger business-wise things, it's just, it's up to me to really define the career that I want, because this isn't something that, Edson wasn't thinking about me when he wrote this. He was actually imagining an Asian actor because it was to represent his uncle. And if it wasn't for me being exceptionally specific with my team and my agents about the kind of work that I want to do, I would have not gotten this because it was my agent that read it because he was representing the production company and said, oh, wow. This would be so interesting for Winston. I could see this. And these are the conversations that we have. We have conversations about things like this. Um, and this would be really a beautiful role for you to stretch yourself into. And once I read it, I said, this is, this is magnificent. I want this. I met Edson. We talked for about two hours and spent 15 minutes talking about the script. We just talked as people, as immigrant men, as men who have to deal with um, erasure and invisibility in our own way. As a black man, I, I deal with that all the time. As an Asian man, he deals with that all the time. Um, and we connected and saw there was a lot more common ground than there were differences, right? And yeah, I have to just be really clear about what I want and really just connect with people on a real authentic, in a real authentic way. And that's going to serve me more than, you know, being ripped sometimes, <laughs> you know, the cheekbones aren't going to be the thing that gets you the job, but it's like real human interpersonal connection. Thank you. I think that um, your answer will help a lot of people. Thank you so much. For sure, for sure. Winston, you, what can we say, except you are just terrific, man. Uh, uh, we appreciate yeah. you and this work and we, as an organization, I'm looking forward to following and supporting your career throughout. Thank you so much. Absolutely. On behalf of the world's largest group of Black film critics, thank you for watching this edition of Africa Roundtables. Have a great day. <laughs>